So today I'm going to introduce you to elementary thermodynamics without making uh, many assumptions about what you might have learned uh, before. Now I'll begin with a quote by Pippard in his book Classical Thermodynamics where he explains that the function of thermodynamics is to link together the many observable properties so that they can be seen as a consequence of a few. Now this is a powerful statement because thermodynamics deals with a very large number of atoms and yet you know it is able to rationalize the effects of a large number of variables in terms of just a few parameters. So supposing that we have all these variables for example any of the elements in the periodic table we have pressure, temperature and crystal structure. That's an awful lot of variables but in thermodynamics that reduces to a few parameters on which all of these variables have an influence. I'm now going to illustrate with an example uh, the powerful statement made by Pippard on how thermodynamics can rationalize a large number of variables into just a few. And the example involves the calculation of the melting temperature of a five component system consisting of iron, manganese, aluminium, gold and magnesium. At this stage, uh, please don't worry about how the calculation is done. The intention here is to illustrate how we can take many many variables and rationalize them in terms of a few in order to calculate the melting temperature of the system without doing experiments. So the calculation relies on the existence of thermodynamic data which are widely available and a computer program which can access those data. And the way in which the computer program works uh, will become clear later on in the lecture and in the lectures that follow. So what are the variables of interest? Well, we can vary the concentration of each of these elements. We can vary things like pressure, temperature and the crystal structure as well. So even though, for example, uh, gold will not exist in the body-centered cubic structure, we can still do a calculation about the effect of gold on this mixture while the gold is in the BCC structure. Now, I've explained already that there exist thermodynamic data banks which have been created over more than half a century, uh, properly assessed data which you can access freely or you can buy depending on where you get the data from. And in these data banks, there's information <clears throat> about how the energy of each element varies with temperature. Now, I've deliberately put energy in inverted commas because I haven't defined exactly what we mean by that. That will come later. And then the data banks also contain how the energy of each element changes with its structure and how these energies change when the elements are mixed together. Therefore, you know, the uh, system contains models for mixtures and we will cover a couple of those models later on. So given all this, we can do the calculation of the melting temperature that I've described. Now, these are the crystal structures of the five elements under ambient conditions. So for example, iron would be body-centered cubic, uh, like manganese, uh, gold and aluminium are face-centered cubic or cubic close-packed, and magnesium is hexagonal close-packed at under ambient conditions. But what we are going to do in our calculation is force everything to be in just the BCC structure, uh, 
and allow only two phases to exist. Uh, one is liquid and the other one is a BCC form of the mixture. So here are the results of the calculations, assuming that only liquid and body-centered cubic crystal structure is allowed to exist in the calculations. So you can see that we can get variations in the melting temperature and sometimes very large variations, for example, in the case of the iron, gold, magnesium alloy. And we have obtained these results without doing any experiments. And we can be confident that they will be fairly accurate because of the efforts that have gone into assessing the thermodynamic data before putting them into data banks. And these are international procedures. Okay, so this is the output from the calculation for a particular temperature, 1633 Kelvin, and uh, one atmosphere of pressure. And we are only allowing liquid and BCC phases to exist uh, at the conditions uh, of 1633 Kelvin and one atmosphere. I have that many moles of liquid and that many moles of uh, BCC solid. And these are the concentrations of each of the elements inside the liquid or inside the solid phase. So we've got the fractions of the phases, we've got the compositions of the phases, and we know which uh, phases are stable at this particular temperature and pressure. And that's all the information that you get from a phase diagram. You'll notice that there are some thermodynamic quantities here such as Gibbs energy, enthalpy, chemical potential, none of which I've actually dealt with as yet, but we'll, we will in the um, information that follows. This is the output for a different temperature, 723 Kelvin, and you can see that the system has completely solidified, the iron, gold, magnesium alloy has completely solidified at this temperature. Uh, liquid is no longer stable. Okay. Let me now formally introduce what we mean by energy in the context of thermodynamics. Now, if I hold up a chunk of material, then its internal energy is a measure of the total energy of all the particles in that substance. And that includes uh, kinetic energy due, for example, to vibrations of atoms. And it includes the chemical potential energy due to the bonding between the atoms. Uh, we use the symbol capital U uh, for internal energy. And as I explained already, it consists of the kinetic energy due to vibrations of particles and the potential energy due to the state of the bonds. Now, of course, um, if, for example, we add heat to this chunk of material, then the internal energy will change. And similarly, if this material does some work, for example, by expanding its volume and pushing against uh, atmospheric pressure, then that uh, will also change the internal energy of the system. Now, suppose I add some heat to our chunk of material, then obviously its internal energy will change and if Q is a quantity of heat added, then that would be uh, equal to the change in internal energy. But this, uh, your substance might also do work, for example, by changing its volume and uh, pushing against atmospheric pressure, and that would have the effect of reducing the internal energy of your chunk. And I've implicitly defined heat added and work done by the system as positive. I'm going to assume throughout this lecture that we are dealing with a closed system. And a closed system is one where we can transfer heat from the external environment, but not transfer mass. So this is an open system where there is not only heat transfer, but also mass transfer. And for the moment, we are dealing with closed system, which allows the transfer of heat, but not of mass.
So we understand how the internal energy depends on the heat added and the work done. And we are going to assume for the moment that dW is zero. Uh, we define a term known as a heat capacity, which is the amount of heat you need to raise the temperature by a certain amount. Okay, so it's dQ by dT. And different materials will have a different ability to absorb heat. Now, since uh, we have assumed that dW is zero, we can write dQ equals dU. And the heat capacity at constant volume is simply given by dU by dT at a constant volume. It will have units of joules per Kelvin. But if you define this for a certain quantity of material, that it could, for example, have units of joules per Kelvin per mole, the specific heat capacity at constant volume, or, for example, joules per Kelvin per gram. In this diagram, K is Boltzmann's constant, and N is the number of uh, particles we have in our uh, substance. And TD here is the divide temperature, which I will define shortly. And we are plotting here the heat capacity at constant volume due to lattice vibrations alone. Okay. And for a large number of solids, the heat capacity at constant volume due to the vibrations of atoms varies like so as a function of temperature. And these vibrations we can think about as occurring along three different directions in the solid. In other words, we have three degrees of freedom. Each one of them uh, will have uh, an energy, uh, kT. And since we have n of these particles in our system, uh, the maximum energy would be 3nK times the temperature and the heat capacity would therefore be 3nK. So at a high enough temperature, which we call the d by temperature, the system will have a heat capacity which is 3nK. K is Boltzmann constant. Now there are two reasons why the heat capacity is less than 3nK when we go to lower temperatures. One is that uh, we can't think of individual particles as oscillating independently. You know, they might undergo collective vibrations which are more difficult than uh, if each particle was vibrating independently. And secondly, uh, quantum effects come in. In other words, the energy absorbed by a material is not uh, continuous but in terms of quanta of energy. And that is the reason why the heat capacity decreases as you go towards uh, low temperatures or zero temperature. There is in fact uh, a zero point energy, so uh, vibrations still take place at zero Kelvin, but the heat capacity is almost zero. Most of the work that we do is not at constant volume, but is at constant pressure. Uh, you know, we work in an atmospheric pressure and that will influence the thermodynamic parameters. And we define another energy known as an enthalpy, which is the sum of the internal energy and pressure times volume. And the heat capacity at constant pressure is the change in enthalpy as a function of the temperature. And that is the quantity that we measure most often because we are actually working in the real world as opposed to at constant volume. Uh, if I have a substance which uh, doesn't undergo phase transformations over the temperature range T1 to T2, then the change in enthalpy, uh, you know, just directly following on from this equation, uh, between temperatures T1 and T2 is simply the heat capacity at constant volume uh, and dt, the integral, over this temperature range. So that will be the amount of enthalpy change when I 
heat the material from T1 to T2. So heat capacity is something that we can measure fairly easily using, uh, for example, calorimetry, and I'll come to that later because it's a part of your practical class. Now, the curve that I defined earlier showing you how the heat capacity of a solid due to lattice vibrations varies as a function of temperature, focused only on lattice vibrations. But in many substances, we have other changes that happen. So for example, uh, this is the heat capacity at constant pressure for iron. Uh, and you can see that it doesn't follow the normal curve. And that's because at about 760 degrees centigrade, we have a transition from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic state, and that contributes enormously to the heat capacity. So much so that the body-centered cubic form of iron would not be stable at ambient temperature and pressure. It would instead be hexagonal close back to iron if this magnetic change did not happen. Now, body-centered cubic iron is what the vast majority of steels are made of, and they greatly improve the quality of life that we experience. On the other hand, if iron was hexagonal close packed uh, under ambient conditions, the mechanical properties would be awful, and we would not have the quality of life or the civilization that we have today. So we have to thank the magnetic transition in iron uh, to contribute to the enormous quality of life that we have today. And there are, of course, phase transitions as, uh, which happen as the temperature rises. Now, notice that even after the ferromagnetic to paramagnetic state, we have excess uh, heat capacity here. And that is because short-range order, uh, short-range magnetic order persists even above the Curie temperature. And there can be many other components to heat capacity. For example, there is a very small component from the electrons in the material. And it's a small component because, um, you know, only the electrons near the Fermi surface can actually change your energies. Whereas in terms of lattice vibrations, all particles can change their energies as the temperature increases. So this is an instrument with which we can measure thermodynamic properties. So this is a differential scanning calorimeter that you will be using in the practical class. And it's very simple in its operation. And this is a modern instrument. Yeah, in the old days, you know, the calorimeters were huge and they were called bomb calorimeters and not very precise. In this case, uh, we can use, you know, samples which are less than one gram in weight and obtain our results in a matter of uh, tens of minutes. So the way it works is that inside this uh, furnace, uh, we have two containers, okay, two identical containers. Uh, only one of them contains your sample, your test sample. The other one is empty. And therefore, the heat capacities of these two will be different because here we have some material. So as we ramp up the temperature, uh, they will develop a small temperature difference. And that small temperature difference is amplified and uh, interpreted in terms of the power that you supply to the pens, uh, to these containers, so that they maintain an almost constant temperature as you heat up the sample. So the difference in temperature that you develop depends on the heat capacity of the material of any phase transformations happening. For example, uh, if we have an amorphous polymer, a glassy polymer, it may crystallize and there will be a heat of crystallization. Uh, and if that is uh, a positive change in enthalpy, that means we are generating heat, then the furnace will have to supply less heat to this sample. So by working out how much less heat you're supplying, you can actually work out the enthalpy change accompanying crystallization. 
So it's a very easy instrument to use and the sort of information you get from it uh, illustrate in the next slide here where uh, we are plotting the output of the differential scanning calorimeter and first of all let me explain this graph where we are plotting the specific volume versus the temperature and you know it's reasonable to expect the volume to decrease as the temperature decreases but supposing that uh, our material is such that it loses atomic mobility at a particular temperature which we'll call the glass transition temperature then here the atoms are eff effectively configurationally frozen and they cannot relax and therefore the specific volume will be higher than what you would expect if the material cooled without configurational freezing. So the ability of the glass to absorb heat is different from the ability of a solid in which the atoms can relax their specific volume. Okay? Therefore, when we get a glass transition, um, and here we are plotting the milliwatts, uh, which is the same as joules per second, it's a power uh, supplied to the pans against uh, temperature as we heat up the sample. At the glass transition temperature, we get a change in heat capacity. So this curve has a different height before and after the glass transition. As we continue heating, we might get crystallization if we started off with a glassy polymer or a glassy substance. And that may have an enthalpy change, which causes again a difference in the power supplied to the two different pans and we might get melting as well so from the area of this curve we can actually determine the enthalpy change uh, of crystallization or of melting here now in your experiment we will not be studying melting we'll simply look at the glass transition and crystallization so it's a particular polymer called plc uh, which uh, melts at a higher temperature than the 150 degrees centigrade that we will do the experiment uh, for. Now let me just uh, show you how to interpret this uh, curve in a little bit more detail. So supposing we are looking at the area under a peak, then the vertical axis uh, was power, joules per second, and the horizontal axis was temperature. So the units of the area occupied by this peak would be joules per second per uh, times Kelvin. Now if you divide the area by the heating rate then you end up with the energy associated with this peak here or this peak here. Then if you divide uh, the energy joules by the amount of material that you have tested then you have the heat of crystallization or the heat of melting per gram of material or whatever units you use to define the quantity of the material. Now I've talked about glass and you'll recall from the last lecture that a glass has a random arrangement of atoms. It's a solid uh, phase and because the atoms are randomly arranged it also has isotropic properties and no structure in the sense uh, that we associate with crystalline materials. And this uh, I pointed out to you is metallic glass made by pouring liquid metal onto a rotating copper wheel to generate this kind of uh, uh, continuous foil which will have a glassy state because the cooling rate here is very large. So there's no opportunity for the liquid to crystallize and therefore it gets to a point where the atoms are configurationally frozen and become a glass. Now, the absence of a structure here is very useful in making transformers where magnetic fields change at a high frequency, for example, 50 or 60 hertz. And the way in which the magnetic uh, uh, the properties of these iron laminates uh, change is illustrated here that at first you know the laminates will have magnetic spins pointing in many different orientations within these regions which are called domains 
But when you apply a field, they'll tend to align to the applied field. And this alignment happens by the growth of the domain, which is best oriented with respect to the applied field. And that means that, you know, domain boundaries move as the field is changed. And if the domain boundaries can move easily, then you don't lose much energy due to the switching from here to here. But in a crystalline material, there are many barriers to the movement of domain boundaries. So the transformer will get hot because of the loss of energy as you switch between these states. But in a glassy uh, iron, that will not be the case because the glass does not contain structure which interferes with domain boundaries. So glass is said to be magnetically soft. That's not commenting on its mechanical properties. It may well be very hard, but domain boundaries can move easily, so it's magnetically soft. So that's a commercial application of uh, glassy uh, metal. Now, it's interesting to ask what thermodynamic parameter describes whether or not a reaction will proceed spontaneously. And, you know, just by intuition, we would say that, look, if, if a reaction results in a decrease in energy, then it, is, it will occur spontaneously. But we need to define, again, the meaning of energy. So, for example, it cannot be enthalpy change that defines the direction of a reaction. Because, look, here is an exothermic reaction, which is happening happily. And here is an endothermic reaction, the melting of ice, which is also happening hap uh, happily. So delta H does not give us a direction in which a reaction may proceed. So there obviously is something missing. We cannot describe reactions or phase transformations happening simply in terms of the internal energy or enthalpy change. We can actually get transformations happening when there is no enthalpy or internal energy change. So there's something else which is happening, which we haven't taken into account. So consider an ideal gas, uh, meaning that, you know, the atoms don't repel each other, nor do they attract each other. Uh, so here are two cylinders with no internal walls. Okay. I want you to comment on which arrangement is more likely. This one, where all the atoms move into the same direction and locate themselves into one half of the cylinder, or this one where they are dis distributed at random throughout the cylinder. And I think you will answer that this one is more likely than this because there are many different arrangements here, whereas only one arrangement where all the atoms are on this side of the cylinder. So this is an ordered scenario, and this is a disordered scenario with many different configurations possible. So I'd like to explain to you uh, what order and disorder mean in terms of thermodynamics. We have to define a quantity which is known as entropy. So this is said to have a higher entropy, configurational entropy, than this arrangement. So Entropy is identified with disorder. So, for example, when a universe started, it was a fairly uniform place uh, with a very low entropy. And then, you know, matter started to cluster and form and so forth, and disorder increased. And the entropy of the universe continues to increase with time. So it actually defines the arrow of time. And Gibbs uh, considered... Uh, Gibbs free energy, which is the enthalpy change minus T times delta S, where delta S is the entropy change. And a reaction, when we take account of both uh, the energetics and the energy due to the entropy change, when we take account of both of those, a reaction can occur spontaneously only if there is a reduction in free energy. So a really important conclusion that we can actually define the direction of a reaction by saying that the free energy is reduced in the course of that reaction. Now, I've 
discuss the arrangement of atoms and the entropy associated with them. But what do we actually mean by configuration? Well, uh, sorry, before that, uh, I ent entropy change uh, is the integral between T1 and T2 of the heat capacity divided by the temperature times dt. So this quantity 2 can be measured using, uh, for example, differential scanning calorimetry. So going back to what we mean by configurations, configurations essentially mean different kinds of arrangements of particles. Okay? And in the case of atoms, you know, uh, this is a case where the red atoms are located on one side and the blue atoms on the other. So this is an ordered arrangement of atoms. Whereas if I allow them to mix, then I have many, many different configurations that I can access. I've only illustrated three over here. So these kinds of arrangements are much more likely than an ordered arrangement like this. So let's work out the number of configurations possible when we put a certain number of A atoms onto a lattice consisting of a certain number of sites. So here is a lattice <coughs> consisting of capital N sites and in the system of uh, A and B atoms I have small n A atoms and therefore capital N minus small n of B atoms. Now I can place the first A atom on any one of these sites, for example here. So there are n ways of locating the first atom. The second atom will only have n minus 1 sites available. Uh, so uh, I can place it on any of the empty sites but not where the first atom is located. And there's a factor of 2 here because we can't really distinguish between the atoms 1 and 2 and an arrangement in which 2 is located at 1. Okay, So these two are indistinguishable and therefore the number of ways of arranging is n uh, the number of times the first atom can be arranged and n mi multiplied by n minus 1 which is the number of sites on which the second atom can be located and divided by 2 because these are exactly identical arrangements. Similarly, the third atom will have only n minus 2 sites left and we divide by 3 factorial because all these arrangements are exactly identical. Okay, if, I, if I interchange 3 with 1, it makes no difference. So to generalize, so to generalize this, from the last slide, uh, this is the total number of arrangements of A atoms on capital N sites at the point where we have exhausted all of the A atoms. And we divide this by the number of A atoms factorial in order to avoid counting equivalent arrangements more than once. Now this top part is only short of capital N factorial by this term here, capital N minus N factorial. So if I set the denominator as N capital N factorial divided by N minus N factorial, that's equal to this. And then we have the small n factorial here. So this is the total number of arrangements we have. And it will be related to entropy uh, because, you know, the greater the number of arrangements, the more likely uh, that uh, uh, that will be. Uh, and therefore, W is related to entropy. But how would it be related to entropy? Well, if we have two bodies and one of them has an entropy S1 and the other one S2, then when we put them together, the total entropy will be S1 plus S2. Now, if we set entropy to equal W, that will not work because, uh, you know, there will be a certain number of arrangements here and another number of arrangements here. If we add up the number of arrangements, that gives us the wrong number of arrangements in this because, you know, we have to multiply arrangements, okay? So if we take the logarithm of W here, and uh, set the proportionality constant to k, which is Boltzmann's constant, then we can add entropies together.
So obviously, when we take the logarithms of the number of arrangements here, um, we are effectively multiplying w1 by w2 because adding logs is equal to multiplying their arguments. So s1 plus s2 is proportional to log of the number of arrangements in body 1 uh, plus log of the number of arrangements in body 2. And that is your general equation for configurational entropy where we replace the proportionality sign by Boltzmann's constant k. Now we are going to deal with the factorials of large numbers uh, and there is a mathematical approximation here that the logarithm of y factorial if y is large is approximately equal to y log y minus y. And I'll also remind you of the definition of a mole fraction that is the number of A atoms, uh, for if we are talking about the mole fraction of A, divided by Avogadro's number, that's uh, the number of atoms in a mole. So that's the definition of a mole fraction. Now this is the total number of ways in which A atoms can be arranged. And I want to take a logarithm of this using the mathematical expression that I gave you uh, earlier. So capital N factorial becomes capital N log capital N minus capital N. And because this is underneath, I have a minus sign here in front of N log N, and this becomes a plus sign, and so on. And you get rid of uh, these, these factors here. So the expression reduces to this simple expression. And in that, we are going to replace capital N by Avogadro's number, and small n and n minus n by the mole fractions of A and B atoms to get our entropy of mixing as minus k into Avogadro's number and 1 minus x log 1 minus x plus x log x. So that's the entropy of mixing when we mix A and B atoms together at random. Now, the fact that the atoms mix together at random means that uh, they don't mind being next to A atoms or B atoms. In other words, the enthalpy of mixing is actually zero. Okay? And in those circumstances, the free energy of mixing is simply minus the temperature times the entropy of mixing. And this plot shows you how the entropy of mixing maximizes when the mole fractions of A and B atoms are equal. That means uh, the number of arrangements uh, is the largest when we have equal fractions of the two. And minus T times delta SM gives us the free energy of mixing here, which is a minimum when we have equal amounts of A and B atoms. Now, when we mix equal amounts of A and B atoms, we have the largest entropy of mixing and the lowest free energy of mixing. And this has uh, sprouted a, a new uh, science in materials that look, if we mix equal amounts of more than two elements together, then we will also maximize the entropy. And therefore there will be a tendency for the mixture of five or more elements to remain as a single solid solution instead of precipitating things. So those kinds of materials where you mix equal amounts of different elements, uh, you know, uh, using something like five different elements to maximize the entropy, uh, those alloys are known as high entropy alloys. So I'm not going to go into them in detail, but you can find three lectures on high entropy alloys on my website, uh, YouTube website, which is called uh, Badisha123.